want to talk about Iceland because I feel like everybody forgot Iceland is one of a kind. It's an island, a fishing island with a huge exposure to tourism, relies on, on very few flights that bring all the <laughs> tourists to that island, and not really famous for banking, not really famous for billionaires, and it was unheard of, but Icelanders became, and you pointed out in your book, three times richer in three years. Brendan, if that's not a success story, <laughs> what is? <laughs> it, 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 at least on paper, they, they were three times richer. <laughs> I, I'm glad you're interested in, in Iceland because it, it's, it's, a, it's a small country. It doesn't get a lot of attention. But what happened there during the financial crisis was very interesting. And I think it's another mm -hmm. good case study for business classes in, in particular. Um, as you alluded to, between 2003 and 2004, the Iceland stock market went up 900 percent in mm -hmm. one year. Mm -hmm. I that's that, that's that's tough to to wrap our head around. Um, <laughs> but as usually happens, um, there was a, a a massive growth in money supply um, leading up to. Uh, the global financial crisis. Uh, in, in Iceland, the money supply expanded tenfold over a 14-year period. The banking system in Iceland collapsed in the span of a week. Um, over the course of three days, the government effectively nationalized the, the, the uh, three largest banks. So, I'm, I'm seeing um, a theme. I'm seeing a theme with those yeah. banks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a theme and um, it, it's going to keep happening. Welcome to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. How to make it, save it, keep it. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question what it means to live a rich life beyond money. My guests share their practices, principles, and evergreen wisdom. I'm your host, Bogumil Baranowski, author, TEDx speaker, investor, and a founding partner of Seacard Associates, a boutique investment firm founded in New York City. Join me on this quest to unearth the wisdom of the ages. I have a new idea to share with you. I call it Meet the Audience. You will find in the notes to this episode a form that you can fill out, put in your email name and answer a couple of questions. And I will be selecting a few listeners every week and invite them to a private one-on-one -on -one Zoom call with me where you can ask any questions you want. If you're interested and you've been listening to the show for a while and you have questions for me and you would like to spend half an hour with me, fill out the form. And even if you're listening to this episode long after the release, I will be still checking the form and uh, selecting listeners. So please go ahead and take advantage of this special opportunity for me to meet you and for you to ask questions. And remember, there are no questions that are too small. I'm very curious to meet you. Go ahead and check out the form. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you're tuning into my podcast. For your convenience, the show is available on a multitude of platforms, including Spotify, Apple, Google, Audible, and many more. If you want to keep up with all new episodes, and there are so many more in the queue, make sure you subscribe and please do share it with friends and family. Review it and rate it if you can. Every little gesture matters, and I thank you for it. If you'd like to know more about me or if you're interested in getting in touch, Simply Google my name and it will lead you straight to my website. There is a contact form there or check notes to this episode for links. I love hearing how you listen to my podcast on your walks, hikes, alone times, drives, trips and more. I trust that my guests and I are a wonderful company on those adventures. I also enjoy reading how some of you are rehearsing and answering some questions that I ask my guests. I love hearing that. If you're new to the show, please scroll down and check out all the amazing guests I've had over the last few months. If you are serious about investing, money wisdom, wealth, and living a better life, you'll find plenty of episodes with some incredible ideas. For those who enjoy reading thoughtful pieces, I regularly write articles on Substack, which I'm sure you'd find insightful. Find me there and follow me as well. Finally, I'd like to mention my latest book, Crisis Investing. It's a collection of 100 essays that I penned for our clients during the tumultuous times of the global COVID pandemic. 
These essays are both timely and timeless, providing a unique perspective on navigating through crises. They were never meant to be published, but here they are available to you. Please find the book on Amazon. The book has already received considerable recognition and much love, ranking among the top releases on Amazon in its initial weeks. Thank you for your support and for being a part of my listener community. Now, without further ado, let's dive into today's episode. My guest today is Brendan Hughes. Brendan has more than a decade of industry experience in investments and public finance since graduating from James Madison University with a Bachelor of Business Administration degree in finance and accounting. For the last several years, Brendan has worked as a registered investment advisor for Lafayette Investments. For Lafayette, Brendan manages a portion of the $800 million in assets under management, primarily for high net worth individuals. Brendan is a chartered financial analyst, CFA charter holder. He has served on various boards and committees, including the James Madison University College of Business Board of Advisors, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's Maryland Chapter, Can Educate, and the Member Engagement Committee for CFA Society Washington. Brendan is a two-time winner of the Tomorrow's Leader Award for his contribution to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Brendan is the author of two books, The Markets in Chaos, A History of the Market Crises Around the World, published by Business Expert Press, and the second book, The Wandering Investor. Today we talk about Brendan's book and research on the stock market crises around the world. We start with the most recent global COVID pandemic and the market chaos that followed. We take a tour around the world, stopping by in Iceland, taking a fresh look at what happened there over a decade ago. Icelanders became three times richer in three years as leverage and banking led to trouble. Brendan shares stories of crises in Latin America and Asia. We have a longer conversation about the dangers of inflation and specifically hyperinflation. Our trip around the world wouldn't be complete without a stop in Africa. We both have great curiosity about the 1970s in the US and the Japanese stock market rise and fall in the 1980s. We both strongly believe that there's always a lot to learn from history and specifically past market crises can help us navigate future stormy seas. Please help me welcome Brendan Hughes. Well, hi, hello, Brendan. How are you? It's so nice to see you. Hi, Bogomel. I'm, I'm doing great. And thank you very much for having me today. So I was introduced to your book, Markets in Chaos, a history of market crises around the world. And I was very impressed with that book. And it really resonated with me because I'm, I'm fascinated with anything that went wrong in the past and what we can learn from it. And your book is an incredible resource, a study of many, many different crashes and crises in the past around the world and what kind of lessons we can learn from them and what, what kind of themes keep on repeating throughout history. But before I ask you about your book and what you've learned for your research, I'm always curious to start with childhood and upbringing. And I'm curious how your story got started, how you got interested in investing, and maybe a little bit more why that uh, interest in crises and what can go wrong and the chaos in the markets, why that part of the market, stock market history? Okay, well, well thank you very much uh, again for having me, Bogomil, and th thank you for the, the kind words about the book and, and such. Um, so s since I was young, I've always liked to be around money. And I think that that's probably a common theme among people in, in investing, or uh, I think at least it, it should be. If, if, if it's not, I think that there's probably something concerning going on there. But in my earlier teen years, I was always working some kind of job um, before I was of age to have a, a, a full-time job. I would mow neighbors' lawns. I would be shoveling driveways um, like in, in the winter with snow and uh, babysitting and, and, and things like that. I was always hustling to, to make money even from an early age. Um, I think my parents instilled in me the value of hard work and the concept of looking for values when shopping for, for, for things and such. And I think that that translates um, pretty well to money management. And I'm, I'm not embarrassed to admit that I shop at, at places like Walmart for groceries. Like the, some of the things that my parents raised um, me with like the a focus on value, what you're getting for your money. I've carried that with me in, in terms of going out and purchasing things in in terms of investing um, and, and also just just in life. 
um, from from an early age, I got to see the value of co compounding. My parents uh, purchased um, some stocks for me, and I would uh, periodically look to see how they were doing. Um, I would I would recommend that uh, other parents uh, use this practice um, because you get to see how money works over a period of time. Like say, say you're young and you had a, a few shares of TJX, which I, I specifically re remember from when I was younger, you get to see it grow over time. And I think that that's really powerful. Um, you'll, you'll have some, some winners, you'll, you'll have some losers, but I think the important thing is that you really start to understand how money works from an, an early age. And I think that that was really powerful for me. And I, it, it definitely got my uh, juices flowing from, from an early age. Um, I've, I've always liked b being around money for, for uh, these reasons. And as an investment advisor today, I'm around money every, every day. And there, there's good and, and bad that, that comes with that. It, at, at times, as I'm sure you're aware, Bogomil, it's enormously stressful to be responsible for other people's fortunes. Um, mm -hmm. and, and during times like the, the, the COVID pandemic, I, it, it's difficult to, to sleep. Um, but there's also a lot of good that, that comes out of, uh, being, being around, uh, money. I, if, if you are raised with a background of, um, you know, that, that I've described, I, I think it's, it's just, it's interesting. Um, and you either like it or, or you don't. And I've always, I've always enjoyed it. Um, and I've, as you, as you mentioned, I've written on topics such, such as, uh, market crises. And I, I, I think that I chose to, uh, to recently write about market crises is because I, I, as I've you know started to get further along in my career, I've thought a lot more about really focusing on wealth preservation. Cause at, at, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that is what's most important. Uh, it, you, you can do it, nothing else matters if, if you lose everyone's money. And I'm not, I'm just not, if you study past market cycles, things like that, um, it, I, I don't agree with people that just say, oh, you can put it into this, this fund and just let, let it do its, its thing and everything will be okay. Like Ray Dalio researched um, countries since 1900 and seven of the top 10 world powers. This is the seven of the top 10, not the, um, right. The, the like some of the worst countries. Seven of the top ten have had their mm -hmm. wealth basically completely eliminated at, at least mm -hmm. once. That's since 1900. So like those types of things, understanding them gets me paranoid to to an extent because I'm responsible mm -hmm. for other people's life fortunes. So um, I think that that's a, a at least a quick overview and um, some some information about what got me um, particularly interested in market crises and. Uh, yeah. I, I love what I'm hearing and I'm writing down so many notes about <laughs> the perception of value that you grow up with. I share a story that my grandma would take me shopping and how she instinctively knew that you know price is one thing, value is something else. And when you pick a tomato or a cucumber or whatever it is, whatever it is, you look at what are you getting, what are you paying? And it really resonated with me once I picked up investing books, whether it was Ben Graham or Buffett or Peter Lynch early on, how it's the same idea. You're paying a certain price, you're getting a certain value. And the power of compounding, I think it just speaks to some people. And once you get it, once you see it, it's very hard to unsee it as a very powerful way to grow wealth over time. You touched on a very interesting topic that resonates with me, which is managing your own money, managing your family's money, and managing other people's money are very different experiences. I had many guests on the show, but I had Guy Spear, who is a, a famous value investor on the show, and we spoke about his experience managing his family money in the initial years and how he basically said he was shaking because he knew what kind of responsibility it is to manage the family money. And speaking of families, you're pointing out something really fascinating. Once you expand your investment horizon from even three, five years to maybe a century, it really matters where that wealth is. And there are not so many countries in the world that offered 
a location, a platform, the framework, the circumstances to preserve wealth over the last 100 or 200 years. And I can really think of a handful. And if you talk about the larger economy, there's just one, the United States, that I can think of that had 200 years where you had the currency that got obviously a lot weaker that you talk about in the book, and I'm sure we'll come back to it. But on relative basis, in terms of democracy, stability, the size, what it offered, I can't think of any other place. And I talk about it in my book, Money, Life, Family, how the location that you choose. And it's an especially sensitive topic to me. I was born in Poland in the last decade of the Cold War era, and uh, I've seen a newly reopened stock market after a 50-year break with a big bull market and a big bear market. So I, I've seen hyperinflation that you talk about. I actually lived through it. And a lot of the stories that you share in the book really spoke to me on a personal level that wealth preservation is more of an exception than a rule, no matter how much money you start with. But I'm sure we'll come back to this. I want to ask you about uh, the last crisis that you start the book with, about the COVID global pandemic. A very unusual crisis. You talk about the speed of the correction, which we all still remember very well, and it came up as a topic on this podcast, the 30-some percent correction in March of 2020, followed by an even more surprising, as you point out, rally that followed. But on top of it, there was a huge acceleration in a lot of trends and adoption of whether it's remote work or entertainment at home or digital services and so on. Kids who were getting their education from home, so did students, and we all worked from home for quite a bit, and many of us still are. A big leap, but so many things happened. Tell me more about that period. What did you learn from it? And it's such a fresh memory to all of us. Yeah, so I'm sure that you, um, just from an investment standpoint, had a similar experience um, to me, but it was an enormously stressful time as, as an investor. Um, everyone was trying to figure out what, what was going on. And the reason that I actually started writing my book on, on markets and chaos was after I saw, you know, this quickest 30% market decline in history, I, I thought, what could I have done to have been better prepared for this? Because um, something that was really interesting was every news outlet was saying, oh, this is an unprecedented situation. Well, mm -hmm. I don't want to take away from what happened in um, the right. COVID-19 crisis. It was terrible in terms of loss of life, um, the economy, a, a, a number of things. But to say that this was unprecedented in history is a wildly untrue statement. I mean, mm -hmm. on m many levels. I, in, in my book, I specifically referenced the Spanish flu in, in 1918 and the, the Black Death in the mid-1300s. Um, in, the, in the Black Death, um, as, and there, the data is not good uh, because this was in the mid-1300s. We don't, obviously, we have much more substantial data sources uh, today, but the rough estimates are between 30 and 60% of all Europeans and between 75 and 200 million people globally died as a result of, of this at a time when the pre-pandemic population was just 475 million. So to say that the the recent crisis was unprecedented is just not, that, that's that's not true. And that, that that's what I, got me interested in, in looking back. And I, I started to, I, I wanted to understand more as to, you know, what, what could, what, what could have better prepared me for this? Um, so we could go down a huge rabbit hole of statistics, but from past pandemics, but I, I think it's um, important to recognize that for thousands of years, pandemics have basically shaped the world that we live in today. And I think that it, I, I, I don't think that that's going to change going forward. Right. Um, People have been trying to think about some of the long lasting effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, as you as you alluded to. You, you, um, obviously, I, I think we're all aware at this point that hybrid work is here to here to stay. You can argue about what degree it'll be around, but for some portion of the population, that's here to stay. And that development has knock on effects for um, office buildings and laterally businesses that provide loans to office buildings and, and things like that. And um, some demand ultimately proved to be pull forward um, from future demand in, in, in areas um, that, that were related to, te to uh, technology. But I think it's clear that 
um, COVID-19 definitely accelerated digitization, which I think is just a long run, running trend. I mean, you have um, the basically people um, spending less cash, shifting more to electronic payments, um, like mobile uh, ordering at, at restaurants, th th things like that. And uh, that's just going to be that has been a long running trend that was accelerated from COVID-19. That's going to continue in the future. I think it's, uh, you would probably agree with that assessment. <laughs> I know. Ab absolutely. It's, it's fascinating because in moments of crisis, in moments of distress, things speed up. Some things get removed and destroyed. They're not relevant anymore. And people forget how many new businesses were started in the 1930s. If you actually look at some of the publicly traded companies, a lot of them took a big leap or were actually started in, in moments of crisis. And I think you pointed it out how this unusual period allowed us to try something different. And I would call it general, you know, intangible, digital, virtual experience, whether it's work, education, entertainment, payments, and you name it. And I think it was a permission not to observe the rules that we've been observing so far, which, for example, mean, to me it means work is only done when you show up at a desk. It's been a religion, a very strong belief, which I had doubts about for many years because given your work and my work, I just need a quiet place to read and obviously be reachable and have decent internet. But it's secondary if I'm sitting at a desk in the middle of you know, midtown New York or um, somewhere in the woods, which I actually, that was the place where I spent some of the early months of COVID. But in those months, I picked up history books, and you point out something fascinating. In moments of doubt, when we're not so sure how the future looks like, somehow for me, looking at or reading a good history book, and I was reading history of plagues, just like you, <laughs> in those weeks. <laughs> and there are a couple of things I walked away with. Yeah, it's the biggest thing was that the pandemics happen in waves. So when I was watching TV and they would tell us it will be over in, in two weeks, every plague, every pandemic in history had waves. And those waves were very inconsistent. They would follow a very you know, random, seemingly random pattern around the world. So some islands in the Pacific would get the worst of the worst of the pandemic. You were talking about 1918, about the Spanish flu. They, the, the flu got to the, some of the islands a year or two later. Not that different than what Australia was experiencing with COVID or New Zealand or, or other places that already celebrated the end of COVID have not seen or had not seen at that moment the worst of it just yet. So I think the whole world took a while to embrace that this is not a two-week thing. This is a multi-year thing, and it will I, change I think you bring the way up, we operate. I think you bring up an excellent point. I, was, I just read a, a recent book on the history of the Middle Ages, and the author is Dan Jones. It's a fascinating book book that I think that everyone should read. But it, it talked about the, the Black Death and um, like relating this to COVID-19, as, as you're, I think you rightfully point out, a lot of times there's basically waves, like the, the waves um, that were associated with the Black Death went on for decades. Now, obviously, we have better technology with vaccines and, and such um, compared to now. But I think it's important to just understand like some potential scenarios, like, like, um, I, I, we're definitely better off than we were in 1350, but, but understanding <laughs> that, that, it, that it's possible that you could just have decades of recurring cycles where, where people just keep getting sick all over the place. It, I think you have to at least understand that that's in the realm of possibility. If, if your goal is to, um, just if you want to understand the, the range of outcomes and, and tie that back to wealth preservation, I think that that's really um, important. But um, as it relates to the, the Black Death, um, that helped basically sow the eventual demise of the Mongol Empire that ultimately mm -hmm. allowed for the uh, for the rise of China and then countries in the West, such as Spain, Portugal, Britain, and um, there was in this particular instance there was a lasting impact, kind of similar to, to some of the things that we've talked about related to COVID nineteen. But the the bargaining power shifted to workers because so many people died from the Black Death that there was a massive worker shortage. It lasted for a long time. So the recurring theme throughout all these 
events is, is that there's world altering moments where there was a pre pandemic world in, in, in a post pandemic world in these really big scenarios. So trying to figure out what, you know, what are the short term impacts and what are the potential long term implications? Because some of these uh, events can have really long lasting impacts that people are just late to understanding. And I think that the more you study these types of uh, events, the the more you are be better able to, to pick on some, some things related to that. I agree. Uh, Brendan, I want to ask you about the government. And the reason I want to ask you about the government, I, I've lived through the dot-com bubble and I've lived through the financial crisis, the housing market crash, and now I've lived through COVID. And uh, I notice how a big theme, and I mention it in my book, Crisis Investing, is the government response. And all I wrote down to myself to remember, <laughs> don't count on it. Don't count on the government to come to help you. But don't underestimate their response yeah. if they do come. And yeah. I'm curious about your thoughts on that front. So I, I think I, I got this. Uh, I get to this later on, but um, basically, um, as I've learned through various case studies, it's been better in general. It's been better off for there to be a swift and forceful response from the, the government in in times of crisis like this. Like the a few times where um, the r response was not uh, basically uh, strong and forceful was the Great Depression, uh, which. Uh, I think we're we we understand where was it was a very bad time. The uh, government response could have been more forceful, and um, also during the the long depression in the 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 eighteen uh, seventies, those were two times where there was prolonged economic m malaise, and I think uh, a, a big part of that was because the government didn't respond forcefully. Um, but obviously, during the the COVID nineteen pandemic, there they brought out all the all all the uh tools and i, I think that that followed in, in the wake of the um of the global financial crisis and i think that that was one of the things that they've learned from crises um in in history but i think it's important to um to go to revisit a titanic moment in in history which was 1971 this cuz if you don't understand what what happened here, I don't think we can understand what where we are today because everything ties back to this moment, at least in my view. Um, 1971, when the U.S. severed the link between uh, the dollar and gold, um, in in the roughly 50 year period since the scrapping of this link, uh, U.S. debt has soared 70 fold, and and this is not something specific to the U.S. This is something going on around the, the world and in most countries, not, not, not all, but, but, but many. Um, but this is what's always happened uh, when we've had unbacked paper money. There's a loss of monetary accountability. Um, mm -hmm. th th this is, I, I've gone back and, and studied a, a lot of these um, uh, events, and this has been a recurring theme. I, I don't know how you feel uh, about um, I feel the same way, and I, I wrote your, about it. In, yeah. <laughs> I feel the same way. I think it's the elephant in the room. That's what I call it in my book, Money Life Family. That's something that we conveniently ignore because you can't see it, the amount of debt and the fact that the, the paper money is not backed by anything. It's all It all relies on trust, that we believe in it. I lived through hyperinflation as a kid, as a teenager in Poland. Poland went through a massive economic transformation from a centrally planned economy, basically disconnected from the world in terms of trade with very big restrictions to completely open economy with a, a booming um, economy for quite a while. But one of the things that happened was hyperinflation. Things were so out of whack and the prices were catching up with reality. And I think hyperinflation is something you have to live through. It's like trying to explain to uh, anybody what's it like to be a fish or to explain to a fish what it's like to be walking on land. Uh, hyperinflation is such a massive force and it's hugely disorienting to people and businesses. And people do, people try to be rational about it and, and they might be making purchases that make no sense and businesses are trying to survive and make decisions that really make the best sense in the moment. But are highly, highly, you know, disruptive in the long run. Uh, 
So any economy that's dancing with higher inflation and, and eventually going into hyperinflation has not fully embraced what kind of risk it is. And uh, in your book, you mentioned some stories with Zimbabwe, with Germany in the 1920s, and uh, Latin America went through their waves too, and many countries around the world. But if you want to jump in and talk about hyperinflation, we can do that. I think it's it's the, the elephant in the room and a danger to any yeah. wealth preservation you can think of. And yeah, do, uh, there are very few places you can hide. Do you want to talk about uh, Zimbabwe specifically? or um, let's, or... let's do that because it's such an okay. incredible case study. And okay. uh, I think we can learn from it. Yeah, I, I think that everyone should study the... Uh, Zimbabwe, what happened in, in the 2000s there. I think this is a great case study for um, business schools uh, specifically. It's um, it, it's unfortunate, but it, it's it's also interesting. And I think that we can learn a lot from it. So, um, and I also wanted to note some of the most famous hyperinflation um, sagas in history include Hungary in the 1940s. I, you, you noted Poland, and uh, I'll include that in, in there. Uh, Yugoslavia in the 1990s, Germany in the 1920s, which I also discuss in my book, and Greece in the 1940s. Um, I, I think it's important to uh, to to basically learn about what what were the seeds for the the hyperinflation saga um, it, that were related to Zimbabwe. The seeds for hyperinflation were planted when Zimbabwe's government launched land reforms that resulted in the government. They went out and seized uh, white-owned farms and gave them to uh, lo local black individuals who didn't have any farming experience. Um, so this development led to a food shortage and then foreign investment dried up. Basically, people didn't want to put their money in um, real estate in Zimbabwe because they were af afraid that the government was just going to come and seize it. Um, and this, this, this all set the table for the hyperinflationary scenario. Um, as is typical in hyperinflationary scenarios, the government was increasing the national debt, which was, that, that was the case in, in Zimbabwe. They were fighting a, a, a war, a, a regional war at that time. The, uh, they were running up deficits as is, the case in, I think, every hyperinflationary scenario. Um, as usually happens when similar s scenarios uh, come to pass, the, the, the government ultimately resorted to price controls, which price controls always stimulate in inflation because then businesses and they don't have an incentive to produce anything because they're not going to turn a profit. If, if their costs are, are going up and they can only make a certain amount of money, they're, they're just not going to produce it. This is what always happens. It stimulates inflation. And that's what happened in Zimbabwe. That's what happened in the United States in the 1970s. And that's what's going to happen again, because I know that governments are going to continue to do it. But it's interesting. <laughs> right. So in, in, we, ne we never in learn. Somehow we never learn. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> in 2008, <laughs> Zimbabwe, uh, the, the inflation was a daily inflation rate of 98%. I, I mean, it's just uh, astonishing. Basically, I can't, they're, can't even imagine that. <laughs> you, 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 at, at, at that time, the basically the local government things like running water, it, it was shut off because the, the economy could just completely shut down. Um, it, it was a very interesting time. And um, Zimbabwe has never really recovered from this hyperinflationary saga. They've, and, and this happens to some countries that where they lose, people lose confidence in, in, in the currency. And sometimes it takes a really long time to restore. And this has been going on since the mid 2000s. They periodically try to um, bring in a new currency, it, it fails. Then a few years later, they'll try and uh, try and you know come up with another currency. It it, it doesn't work out. Um, but I, I also wanted to touch on one more concept that kind of ties into hyperinflation, as you alluded to with with Poland. There's been this idea in recent years. People have proposed have uh, proposed this modern monetary theory, which is, <laughs> it, it, is mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I, I think it's been disproven for a long period of time. The, the, the idea that 
you can just run up deficits without any consequences because you monopolize your currency and can you can never default on it. That That's true. But you have situations like Zimbabwe where people just say, OK, we don't we don't trust this. We're, we're not we're going to pull our money out of it. Or you have a situation in Japan, like what, what I talked about, where there's there's high deficits, but people don't in, invest. They hoard the cash and you just have basically no growth for decades. So th I, I don't understand how this is a theory because I think I think it's been disproven for the last few thousand years but uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's absolute nonsense but uh, the truth is that there's a big difference if you have your debt mostly in your own currency or in a foreign currency and the United States has a very unusual, very privileged position that's not appreciated enough the fact that the u.s is uh, borrowing mostly if not exclusively in the u.s dollar which is very unusual even in europe countries borrow not just in the euro and then if you think of latin america or asia because of the trust in the dollar people would usually borrow in the dollar but then earn whether it's tax revenue or you know, business revenue business profits in their local currency so you put yourself in an extremely vulnerable position. And, and Poland experienced a s similar situation where they borrowed quite a bit. It overlaps with the Latin American crisis in the 80s when Poland was borrowing in the 70s and had to face a very expensive public debt, a uh, government's debt in uh, the dollar in the 80s and had to negotiate, renegotiate, and then eventually pay it off as I was growing up. So I have a vivid memory of those <laughs> conversations. Yeah. But and, go ahead. And, and what you what, what what you just alluded to happens frequently, where countries bar, borrow in like the U.S. dollar, and then they they don't think about it until they realize that they don't have enough reserves on hand. That's what happened, as you said, in the Latin American de de debt crisis. It happened in the Asian financial crisis as, as well in the mid nineteen nineties. But I think the big theme is that we never learn. You talk about Latin America, and we can jump in and talk about that, and you can set the stage. But I would add that Argentina, I think, holds one of the records in terms of defaults. And I, when I was in college, Argentina just devalued its currency, and I think took over dollar deposits that people had in the banks and converted them at half the value or less, basically, if you don't call that theft, I'll let the audience decide what's that called if half of your money <laughs> is gone because of a government's decision. Something that Americans never experienced. Maybe they did, actually, but not knowingly, when the, the, the dollar went off the gold standard on two occasions, once in the 30s and then in the 70s. You write about it in the book, you might chime in. I talk about it in my books to remind people that yeah. holding gold was illegal at some point in the free country that the United States is, and yeah. I'm American and Polish, so I, I, I feel it on many levels. But uh, let's talk about Latin America, what happened in there, because uh, it's yet another continent that did not escape chaos and crises, and if anything, got more than a fair share of those. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the um, what set the table for uh, the Latin American debt crisis in the 1980s was the oil shocks in, in the 1970s, mm -hmm. because the Latin American countries were big net oil importers. So when in oil in the span of one year in the 1970s went from two dollars and fifty cents a barrel to eleven dollars and fifty cents and so we think that you know in, in the in the past year you know this is a pretty big spike well it's it's nothing compared to what what happened in right. 19, right. 1970 so what when that happened it, it set off a, a wave of defaults in, in Latin America. There was so soaring debt levels, and ultimately, sixteen countries in Latin America rescheduled their their debts as a result. Um, I, I I did a case study on uh, Chile, and um, the mm -hmm. Chilean crisis uh, began in nineteen eighty two, and like all crises that I've studied, it was the result of loose financial oversight and extended period of booming credit creation, and um, the, the one of the triggers uh, was that 
as you had alluded to, they were borrowing in dollars and they were issuing debt in, in local currency without proper reserves. And the, the trigger was when the United States started their monetary tightening in, in, in the early 1980s. Uh, I, I think it was in 19, yeah, in 1981, that, that was when uh, Paul Volcker famously wa- uh, waged his <laughs> war on uh, in, in his, yeah, his war on inflation <laughs> and interest rates in the United States went up to 20%, which is obviously well above what we're familiar with these days. Yeah. Um, so th- that caused a lot of problems for um, Ch- Chile uh, specifically, because at that time there was also declining commodity prices. So Ch- Chile to this day is is heavily reliant on copper. Um, so th- the combination of, of those things um, basically blew up everything in, in the Latin American market. And I wouldn't be surprised um, just given the extreme moves um with with what's happened with interest rates in the United States and how it it's still so interconnected with what's going on with the world i think we're still early in seeing how this plays out in in terms of how it's going to affect other currencies and and things like i think there's going to be more of like what we saw with latin america just just because of uh, ha- having studied these types of things i i i think that the, the odds are likely that we're going to see more of that. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think as we've discussed, uh, Chile responded this to this disaster with a swift policy response. And I, I've learned that if you are going to use, you know, unbacked paper money and have a fractional reserve banking and, and, and such, if you're going to continue down that path, the, the best way to mitigate basically having a prolonged depression in, in, in an instance like this is to have a swift policy response. Chile did that. The central bank initiated very various restructuring programs and the government nationalized 14 of the 26 banks. Um, and Ch- Chile recovered relatively well f- from this. And I think um, at least when you're talking about regionally, they've been a success story um, for the for the last uh, several decades. And I think uh, they've they've endorsed free trade. They've been fiscally conservative, which is important, uh, you know, whether some people want to think it is or not. I think it's very important. Um, they've enforced local laws and contracts and they have managed their currency and exchange reserves much better than they did in the, in the 1980s. It's that's very true. You know, I'm thinking of banks. I had John Maxfield on on this podcast, who is a, a banking analyst, banking expert with a family history in banking, which overlaps with the topics we talk about, family wealth preservation. His family has been in the f- banking business for five generations. And I told him, John, there are very few places on earth that provided stability for anybody to own a bank over that long of a period of time. And you just talked about Chile. How many banks are around just in the name? But if you looked at the shareholder base, that shareholder base got wiped out time after time after time, including some big European banks, including some of them <laughs> not long ago, uh, big, big names that got completely removed from <laughs> from existence. Yeah. So uh, banks have, are a very powerful part of the story, but also a very vulnerable part of the story. And I'll ask you in a second about Iceland and what happened with banks there and what happened with that story, because I think it's a fascinating lesson. But I, I want to mention the hundred year hundred year bond that Argentina issued. I want to say five, six, seven years ago, and I went in New York to a meeting where they were presenting and pitching this hundred year bond in dollars to investors in New York, and the room was full and there was a huge interest. And only you know, fifteen, seventeen years earlier. Uh, around the year 2000, 2001, 2002, I remember Argentina imploding. And I was thinking, what are the odds of that happening all over again? It looks like the building blocks are still in place for something like this to happen again. And you might know how poorly that 100-year bond has performed and uh, has caused big losses, not just that particular issue of many others, but, <laughs> but this one was really a big thing to accept and to trust Argentina for a hundred years <laughs> yet I, all it, over again. What, so. 
<laughs> what was, and I, I think you brought up a, a fascinating topic, and, and I, 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 I would like to at least for a little bit touch upon the environment after the global financial crisis, because I think that that's also a, mm. a critical element to understanding where we are today, where, where we have been. Um, I, I think it's well documented that there was ultra easy policies, as you've mm-hmm. alluded to, with a 100-year bond effectively y- yielding nothing and then people <laughs> getting excited about it. Like that, that, That's an encapsulation of the craziness that was going on at, at, um, during that time period. That's only really reversed somewhat, but, but now people that have only lived in the past decade think that 5% is a really high interest rate when that's not, historically, that is not at all a, a high interest rate. But just set, setting the the table the 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 idea that was pitched at least from central bankers was that we're going to um initiate these ultra easy um policies and it's going to stimulate growth it's going to take it it's going to you know help us get out of the global financial crisis it never Mm -hmm. really stimulated growth the the only what basically happened was the market for assets just went went through the you you saw housing stocks cryptocurrencies like, like like things that literally used cars used cars get more expensive than new cars yeah i I mean (laughs) cash wasn't earning anything so people put their money in anything but cash that's what they're Mm -hmm. incentivized to do like that's so that's that's what happened i think that um just there will be a lot more case studies on um you know the pros and cons of, of 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 what happened but i think it's probably safe to say that zero percent in terms of um interest rates is too low i think i think that i think most people would <laughs> would, would now agree with with, with that a- assessment um because i don't i don't know what the argument is in in favor of a whole i think every crisis is ultimately predated by an extended period of monetary policy. And the, this, what happened after the financial crisis was, was, it was very extreme, even, even by, um, you know, going back over whatever time period you want. Uh, but um, easy monetary policies, if, if they're done in excess and for a, a long period of time, that is a precursor for um, basically every crisis. You know, the saying kicking the can. And I think that really explains what's happening here. So there is some argument that using those tools, more debt and cheaper money in moments of distress can really help. And there might be a liquidity crisis. And I think we had one of those in March of 2020, but it was so brief that people moved on. But there was a moment when treasuries were trading in strange ways. And I think there was a moment of an equivalent of a heart attack when it comes to the markets, where you want the parent (laughs) to step in and create a moment of of peace and stability. But then you allow the market to resume its normal operation. If you don't, then if you keep zero rates for a prolonged period of time, as you pointed out, and if you keep on adding more debt to it, and if you add and expand the role of the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States, where the bank is participating in the market in ways we haven't seen in the past, and that this particular institution was not supposed to, then the distortions lay the ground for the next crisis. And I think that's what you're alluding to. I want to talk about Iceland because I feel like everybody forgot Iceland. The only way people remember Iceland is cheap cheap flights and geysers and volcanoes. But there was something remarkable (laughs) that happened in Iceland. And the reason I remember it is because I listened to Michael Lewis in New York give a talk when he wrote his boomerang book, when he traveled to all the countries that experienced the echo of the financial housing market crash of 08, 09 that followed it was Greece, it was Iceland, it was Portugal. But Iceland is one of a kind. It's an island, a fishing island with a huge exposure to tourism, relies on, on very few flights that bring all the <laughs> tourists to that island, and not really famous for banking, not really famous for billionaires, and it was unheard of. But Icelanders became, and you pointed out in your book, three times richer in three years. <laughs> 
Brendan, is that's not a success story. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, 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 at least on paper there there were three times <laughs> retro <laughs> I, i'm glad you're interested in in iceland because it, it's it's a, it's a small country it doesn't get a lot of attention but what happened there during the financial crisis was very interesting and i think it's another mm -hmm. good case study for business classes in, in particular um, as you alluded to, between 2003 and 2004, the Iceland stock market went up 900 percent in mm -hmm. one year. Mm -hmm. I, that, that, that's that's tough to to wrap our head around. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but as usually happens, um, there was a, a, a massive growth in money supply um, leading up to uh the global financial crisis. Uh, in, in Iceland, the money supply expanded tenfold over a 14 year period. And this is a, a common theme when you don't have any laws, like um, an, an issue with the way that um, a lot of fractional reserve systems are, are, are set up these days is the, the interests of the private commercial banks and the health of the overall country are not aligned. Like the, the, mm -hmm. the Private commercial banks care about how much profit they produce because that's what they're incentivized to do. Right. And if they have the ability to just print how much money they want, they don't have to worry about you know a, a debt crisis or something or what, what's going on with the um, the overall country. These things are going to keep happening, and that that's 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 what happened in Iceland. And um, in Iceland during the financial crisis, it was just stunning. Like e even by banking standards, it, it developed very quickly. The entire banking system in Iceland collapsed in the span of a week. Um, over the course of three days, the government effectively nationalized the the, the uh, three largest banks, which were the bulk of the um, of 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 the banking assets uh, so i'm seeing um, a theme i'm seeing a theme with those yeah, banks <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, it's a theme and um it, it's going to keep happening uh if something isn't changed you can argue the the, the pros and cons but the reality is it, if banks are, are are set up where um they earn one to two percent return on assets and then they use like approximately 15 to one leverage by printing money to finance yep. this leverage everything can look okay one day but then when you know something a little bit out of the ordinary happens all of a sudden you're you're, you're out of you're, people will go to retrieve their assets at, at, at the same time um as as you usually happens there's 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 a bank run and then the the government s says, "Is this too big to to fail? If 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 not, they you know everyone loses everything." In the U.S., you have the FDIC insuring up to two hundred fifty thousand. Um, but I think a interesting question uh, is, um, you know, to to what degree should we incentivize this behavior? Because when we have these bailouts, the the taxpayer is is on the Hook for, hook for this. Uh, people knew right. the people should have known the risks going into into this. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I, I grew up in a whole different world, and then I went to schools around Europe and came to the U.S. So I collected experiences along the way, and I remember in the '90s the interest rates in Poland were much higher than in the U.S. They were you know high double digits, and my parents uh, are doctors, and they're not economists or, or financial experts, but they would open CDs, and as inflation would go down, effectively they would compound their savings at a much higher rate than you think. But the one thing that I do remember is my parents checking the health and the quality of the new banks that were opening, who was behind them, what kind of capital they have, what kind of business they're in. They were going out of their way to understand if the money is safe with those banks, because there was no such thing, at least not in an effective way, as FDIC insurance of deposits. So it was up to you, the consumer, to make sure that you give the money to somebody you can trust. And some of those banks went bust. Some of those banks got acquired, got bigger, and, and grew, and, and became you know big players. But it was up to the consumer to decide. In most of the developed world these days, including Poland, people don't even think anymore if this bank is healthy, there's some sort of a deposit insurance. So you outsource your thinking and decision-making and your responsibility 
to a large government body that says, no, whatever happens, we'll step in and we'll do something about it. And they've done it with Silicon Valley Bank only this year and few other banks this year as well. So the system works when very few banks fail. Uh, during the 1930s, a lot of banks were failing and there were real bank runs where people would run and get the cash. And I, I've actually seen as a kid, as a teenager, bank runs with people running to banks and trying to get money out of banks that are failing. But it is remarkable to me that after living in the U.S. for two decades, I'm seeing bank runs in the U.S., something that I thought is just my childhood memory, a long you know, left behind to forget. <laughs> and here, you know, we've seen bank runs in a whole different world with, you know, social media sharing Twitter and photos and, and everybody actually seeing it and experience, experiencing it. We had clients that had money with some of the banks that might have been at risk. And so we took calls and had conversations with them what to do about it. The bank runs are a peculiar thing because once people stop trusting the institution and t start taking money out because of what you just mentioned, the fractional reserve system, you will make the next bank fail, not because it deserves to, but because <laughs> because of, of uh, the wisdom of the crowd, whatever you call it, people are running the, in the other direction. So I think we'll see more of it as much as we might see more of other chaos and crises that you point out. Yeah. Brenda, yeah, I, if I, you I, indulge me, I want to talk about the 1970s. And the reason why I want to talk about... Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Go, yeah, we, we can move on to the 1970s. That, that's, that, that sounds great. The reason I want to ask about the 1970s, I'm, I'm 43, and I started in the business in 2005. So 18 years, uh, short, long, however you want to look at it. But when I got started, there were quite a few senior partners uh, that I worked with that got started in the 70s. And they got really, they were really shaped by that time. And I've heard all kinds of stories. One of them became a famous gold investor. And I think gold resonates with you if I'm reading between the lines, John Hathaway, that you might know the name of. And other partners that remember the 70s. So I heard stories from all different angles of what happened back then. And you talk about that period in the US because US has not experienced anything like that since and the only period that was anything like it was the 1930s at least in the last you know 100 years tell me about the 70s what happened what can we learn from it you talk about the oil price shock you talked about uh, price controls some big macro events and that overlapped with the dollar effectively going off the gold standard and gold trading freely for the first time since the 1930s. Yes, and um, yeah, thank you for um, taking us uh, back to the 1970s because I, I think that there are some important themes going on today that, that tie back to what was going on back then. And um, there's a, a strange irony in um, the unfortunate events this weekend that, that tie directly into what happened 50 years ago, but we'll get there in in, in a second. Um, yeah, so 1970s in, in the U United States, um, a few differences between today and in the 1970s is, for one, the global energy market looks different. The United States today is a much um, bigger player than, than it was in, in the 1970s, owing to the rise of shale oil. That's, that's a, 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 a big difference. Um, another key difference uh, today com in comparison to the 1970s is that uh, balance sheets are in, in much worse shape. Um, I don't think that there's, uh, there's any debate that government balance sheets today are, are, are much worse than they were in the 1970s. But the 1970s era was um, defined by what we now call stagflation, um, which a lot of people weren't even familiar probably with this term up until the, the past <laughs> few years because nobody even thought about inflation for, for a long period of time. The focus mm -hmm. was more on deflation and how do we get our inflation rate up to 2% to and well, all of a sudden you do have inflation. So people, I think we're then going back to 1970, the 1970s and seeing what could we learn from this. Um, but stagflation is a period of low growth 
uh, or yeah, period of low growth and, and, and high in inflation. And uh, between 1973 and 1982, there were three technical recessions during this uh, stagflationary era. Um, but one of the key events that um, happened in, in 1973 that, that eerily is, is similar to today, Syria and Egypt attacked Israel in what would become known as the Yom Kippur War. Um, this event rocked the oil market that was already being upended by the rising influence of OPEC. And OPEC, I think, was founded, I would have to go back to my book, but I think it was 1957. But they, their influence had had been just increasing in the, in the period leading up to the Yom Kippur War. So th those two events were critical to the skyrocketing uh oil prices. Um, between 1973 and 1974, as I uh, alluded to, the oil price per barrel went from 250 to 1150. And this, this was when the United States was much more dependent on uh, foreign oil. So it, it impacted the United States to a much larger degree than uh, we're more self-sufficient today than, than we were um, back then. But there were widespread oil shortages. Um, I, I alluded to it in my book, but um, there was like apparently hours long lines at, at gas stations, as, as you um, probably studied in some more developing countries, probably still going on to this day. But that was something that was um, unusual. And that we have, if you grew up in the United States today, that's not something that um, you, you would ever really think about. But that, that, that happened. And um, President uh, Richard Nixon responded, um, as usually happens when inflation skyrockets, um, by implementing uh, wage and, 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 and price controls. Naturally, this mm -hmm. stoked inflation further. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know why we. <laughs> It, it's it's been a recurring theme throughout a lot of the the case studies I, I I've looked at, and yet it, it continues to happen. I, I don't understand it, but th th there it we seems are. like a quick fix. <laughs> it seems like a yeah. quick fix, and I think it also taps into the idea that we are the government, and we're going to tell the economy where it belongs. And it's a mistake that a lot of countries have made in the past. The economy is like a force of nature. <laughs> it will go wherever it wants to go. If you don't allow people to do a certain thing, but they really need to do it. Uh, in Poland, for example, uh, it was a centrally planned economy still until 1989 or so, and there were shortages in stores because the government-owned companies would not provide enough of anything, and people would still trade in simple goods the same way they did in Zimbabwe and the same day, way they are doing in Venezuela today outside of the official system. So the economy, it's like a river. You know, it will find a way to the ocean. And no matter how many dams you build and how many laws you pass, and price controls or whatever it is, the water <laughs> will find a way to get through. And those price controls obviously didn't work. I, I, I want to touch upon a, a few like, um, a few items that got us to the end of the um the really high in stagflation era. Um, one of them ties um, directly back to where we are today, the topic of labor unions, because uh, that, that was a hot topic back then. Um, in the 1970s, labor unions had, had a lot of power, and that was putting upward pressure on it, in inflation. Um, President Reagan in the early 1980s launched a well-documented assault on on uh, labor unions. And a lot of people think that that led to the long-term decline of labor unions, which has only resurfaced in, in the past few years. So, so um, there's a lot of similar themes when you're looking back then uh, com compared to today that really haven't happened in, in 40, 50 years. Um, but the another key component that got us to the end of um, what was going on in the 1970s was when uh, ener 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 energy markets began to stabilize when um, President Reagan fully deregulated oil prices in 1981. This was important because then the non-OPEC producers, again, had incentive to produce oil. So mm -hmm. um, eventually that helped the price of oil come back in line with market fundamentals because 
a, a free market was or a more free market was uh, allowed to operate. And I don't think it should be surprising that, um, you know, given the incentives at play, how that developed. And um, all of this was capped off with, as we touched upon, Paul Volcker jacked up interest rates to 20% in 1981. Um, inflation did eventually come under control in 1983. It got down to a bit over 3%. Mm -hmm. And I think a couple of things happened at the same time. Uh, one of them was China truly joining the world economy and providing low-cost manufacturing over time. At first it was Taiwan, but then followed by China in a large way. And... Um, global trade opening up more, I think that also created a way for the pressures to kind of escape the system. And obviously the oil dynamics that you mentioned, I think helped and, and the US growing its independence. But the thing is that when you create a friction like that, it, people forgot, maybe some people remember the kind of cars that were on the roads in 1970 and the cars that were on the roads in the 1980s. And I think Europe went even further, going into smaller, tinier little things with two doors. <laughs> but uh, energy efficiency on all levels became a big thing. So the demand it, it, shifted it, and, and in some it, places it shrunk. And I'm, I'm really gl glad that uh, you brought this up because this kind of takes us to uh, one of our ne next topics, because um, as you alluded to, people were searching for like more energy efficient vehicles. Well, the United States autom mm -hmm. automobile producers were caught off guard. They weren't ready for this shift. So um, Japan yeah. greatly benefited um, from, from this mm -hmm. at the United States expense in terms of the automobile producers, because um, the U.S. producers were ru running up huge losses and uh, the Japanese automobile manufacturers were much better prepared for what was um, happening at that time period. And that set the stage for the um, period of time where everyone said that Japan was, you know, going to overtake the U.S. in economic strength. And um, there, Japan was booming in, in the 1980s. Mm hmm. And it's a fascinating period. And the reason I wanted to ask you about it was I visited all, all kinds of investors, seasoned investors, legendary investors over the years. And I remember one specifically that had quite a few books about the 1970s and the 1980s. And the 1980s books really caught my attention because a lot of them were about Japan, that Japan is the future. And people might forget, but there was a time in the 80s when Japanese businesses were buying everything from high rises in New York City all the way to movie studios in Hollywood. And it looked like this is the century of Japan. And there was a point that you mentioned in the book when the, the, the value of the land in Tokyo, of a certain part of the city, it was more than an equivalent of a, I don't know, another place on earth. The, 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 it was all out of proportion. I think that was the the, the point. And the, the stock market in Japan uh, rose really, really high, imploded, and has been trying to find its way back for the last 30-some years. Yeah. Bogomo, I'm glad that you brought us to this topic because this is another fascinating um, scenario. And similar to China in the 2000s, Japan saw years of export-led growth that boosted the economy in the 1980s. And um, what I've learned is if you don't have an encore to this export-led led growth, it's not going to be sustainable. You have to have some cultivation of a consu consumer class d domestically to, in order for this to basically continue over the, the long term. Um, but what happened in Japan in the late, teen, the late 1980s was astounding. Most people, um, or some consider the Japanese market bubble um, to be the greatest in history in terms of total market capitalization and, re and recovery time. And that, that, that could be an accurate assessment. As you alluded to, at one point, the Imperial Palace in, in Japan, which is their equivalent of the, the White House, it was the residence of the Emperor of Japan, so, you know, a oversized house was reported to have been worth more than the state of California. Yes, uh, that's difficult to, mm -hmm. to to understand. But that that stuff was going on th th throughout Japan. The, the 
to give you a, a sense of, in terms of the stock market, the PE ratio, the average PE ratio was over 60. Um, so th the, basically the entire Japanese market, real estate, stocks, everything was was in, in a bubble. And people, um, I, I think uh, the famous investor, uh, T Terry Smith alluded to this. Uh, he mm -hmm. said that people were trying to justify saying, oh, the accounting's different and, 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 and things like that. But <laughs> at, at, as, as we now know, it was an epic bubble. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if you had dumped all of your money into stocks, uh, Japanese stocks at the end, at the end of the 1980s, just this year, you would have earned a positive return. People in the Japanese market for three decades, if whether it be um, bonds or equities, you you wouldn't have earned anything. So, you know, that this brings us back to, to wealth preservation. It's not as easy as some people think it is. Like if, if, you, if you were a domestic investor in Japan and you had just kept everything there um, for the past 30 years, up until the the past couple, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have had any return. If, if, um, and I, I think that that's an important thing to, to think about, I'm not saying that, you know, markets like the, the U S won't continue to be good markets, but you have to at least entertain the, the idea that things, you know, in, in certain markets may not be as good as they were in, in, in the past. And you just have to understand that, what happened in Japan, what's happened in other markets, that's in the the realm of possibility. Um, I, I think that people normally only think about what they've experienced in the last 10 years or, um, you know, more broadly their lifetime and say, this is the way the world has always worked. And this is this is how things are. But um, that, that I think that's really, really dangerous. Um, and if you're in charge of managing other people's money, I think that it's your duty to understand these range of outcomes. Um, I don't know if you feel the, the same way, but I, I would think you probably do. I, I do. And I want to come back to it and ask you more about investing in this age of crises. But before that, you were talking about uh, what I'm hearing is passive investing, how people look at the, the last even 100 years, and they say U.S. equities have returned this much. And they look at a, a very long period of time, or they look at a decade or two, where we might have gone from rates that were you know, 5% to zero, a very different setup. I want to point out that there were periods in the U.S. market when the market went nowhere between 1929 and 1954, 1969 and 1981, and then the dot-com bubble, some of the companies needed 15 years to come back to the price that they were at during the peak of the dot-com bubble. Incredible companies with huge profits, huge potential, but it took them 15 years to just get back to even. That's longer than even the most patient and disciplined investors are willing to wait, right? That's something I, to keep in mind. Yes. Go ahead. I, 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 no, I, I completely agree with your thinking. I think you have some very nice research there to supplement that line, line of thinking. And um, I think it's important for people to understand that. And if you look at the stock market as a, as a lab, economic, social, financial lab where things happen, if you just look at one market, whether you are in operating out of London and you look only at Europe or if you're operating out of the US and you only look at the US, you limit the range of outcomes to consider. And I think you're doing a remarkable job because you looked around the whole world. And by the way, you wrote the other book, Wandering Investor, where you <laughs> traveled to, to some 18, 20 countries and, and you describe, and I highly recommend that book, to, not just the economies, but the markets and anything unique about those countries. So you had the exposure to a whole variety of outcomes. And you mentioned how anybody that grew up in the US has never seen a bank run or hyperinflation or many things that we mentioned today. And I think it's very helpful for all of us, no matter who is listening, where they're listening, to look outside of their domestic market and see that the outcomes can have a much wider range than what we're used to. And that's something worth keeping in mind when you're managing your own money, your family's money, other people's money. And with, when you're thinking about the true long-term wealth preservation, you're not just thinking about this quarter or this year that you have to beat a certain benchmark, 
that actually becomes so secondary <laughs> to your consideration when you start to think about what's the big plan. So I want to talk more about that. You, you manage money for wealthy individuals. You build portfolios and you pick individual stocks. You are very aware of what can go wrong. Too much debt, cheap money, hyperinflation, bank runs, businesses getting nationalized and so on. How do you plan and think about it when you're making your investments, when you want to be a bottom-up stock, pick, stock picker? But I always say that it's nice to look outside the window if it's raining or not because it will give you a better context of what kind of investments you could consider yeah. or maybe you should be more aware of, what kind yeah, of risks I, you should be more aware of. I mean, from a portfolio context, I try and plug it into some of these scenarios that we've discussed and just think about how they would behave and e even look at, you know, individual businesses um, d during these periods of time and just mm -hmm. seeing what is what is going to come out um, the, the other so side of this. Um, I, I think that uh, like things like uh, Terry Smith, uh, the famous investor that runs fund smith equity fund he he, he likes to uh br to bring up uh i believe it was either diageo or um no, no it, was, it was brown foreman since because that's a pure mm -hmm. u.s company but he likes to use the example they they were purely um a alcohol company heading into the mm. heading into prohibition so they're only product <laughs> was deemed to be illegal and they uh -huh. they they survived so like i think mm -hmm. those types of things are important important to think about from a portfolio context if something so extreme as, as something like that happens how is your portfolio going to behave um we've touched upon it uh, a number of times but um uh, I, I do think that things like uh, country diversification are more important than a lot of people think. It, I think a lot of U.S. Mm -hmm. investors don't have an appreciation for it just because the U.S. market has been so good on a relative basis for, for so long. I'm not saying that it won't be in, in the future, but I, I think it's to make that uh, judgment, it's based on a bunch of variables that are completely unknowable. Um, Mm -hmm. But I don't know how you feel, but I do. One of the issues that I run into is, um, and this is good from the United States' perspective, is I, I find it more difficult to find good, the, the level of quality of businesses that, that I'm seeking in, in markets overseas. Not that there aren't any. I mean, you have like the fashion houses and drinks companies in Western Europe, which I think are good businesses. ASML is a, is a, is a good business in Netherlands, Novo Nordisk, Denmark, a few IT companies in India, semiconductor businesses in Southeast Asia. Those are, those are good businesses in, in, in my view. There are some out there, but like when we're looking at developed markets like Japan and Germany, they're, they're still being primarily led by manufacturing, like automobiles, th things, things like that, so, that I view as being very poor um, businesses. It, it, this is a world that's shifted to service and technology led. So um, from the U.S.'s perspective, I think that reflects well, because I, I think in, innovation is, is still thriving here on a, a relative basis. But even taking that into account, I do think you need to have some country diversification because over the course of history, as uh, you've studied uh, as well, various things happen, like governments confiscate assets, th th things like that happen. Mm -hmm. it's a, you can have the best business in the world, but if the government says, well, you know, we're nationalizing this, it doesn't make any difference. Um, but the, so it you lessens kind of the odds. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. It, it lessens the odds of that happening from a portfolio standpoint if you do have some degree of diversification i don't want to you know say that this is going to happen in this market or, or that market but if you have everything in one market mm -hmm. and then like if you had all your your money in south africa i think in like 1917 before they passed the Na native land act if you had all your money in, in property there and the government said well we're we're taking it well there's nothing you would have been able 
to do. Th those types of things do happen. I think just think it's important to be aware of. And I think you have an uh, appreciation um, about that as well. You know, having worked with families with multi-generational wealth and wealth creators that created wealth in this lifetime, but especially families with a lot of history, I've heard too many stories of wealth confiscation in so many places on earth in all kinds of you know, contexts where the wealth was just taken away. So that's something to keep in mind. And we started with the quality of sleep. You hinted on it, and I, I write about it. The quality of sleep, to me, it's a good test. If, is it an investment that I can sleep well? holding and if my clients can also sleep well that's the ultimate test what gives me some peace of mind on that front is that when you look at the S&P 500 let's say how much of the business is outside of the US it's these are very well diversified businesses with revenue and profits coming from all over the world so that gives me some peace of mind and I'll explain why and I write about it in one of the books about the Cuban experience you you know Bacardi and you know Havana Club and two different stories, two different families with their, their own complexities. They're fascinating books. But Bacardi had operations outside of Cuba and had some patent protection, brand protection in the United States. Havana Club was mostly in Cuba, and they pretty much lost it all. They were not able to resume their operations when Cuba was taken over by Castro. And Bacardi continues to this day, acquired other businesses, they uh, operate successfully, and they're a very famous brand. Havana Club was licensed in many different ways. You might come across the brand, but the, the family, to, my, uh, to the extent that I know, is no longer benefiting from the sales, if anything. Uh, the Cuban government was at some point. I don't know the details uh, up, you know, up to date today what the, the arrangement of licensing is but two examples where one family had their operations assets and intellectual property in more than one place and the other one that unfortunately was more in one single place that was very promising Cuba was a remarkable booming place at some point and hopefully will be again in, in my lifetime our lifetime that's that's one of the hopes I have for the world but that's a, a great example of wealth confiscation that happened. Now, on an individual stock level, there are a couple of things that you know, we look at the level of the debt, how loyal is the customer base, where their operations, and so on. So even if you are exclusively invested in the US, some of the companies have more than half or sometimes 70% of their actual profits in not in the US. I write about it in my books how I do like and I appreciate having lived in, in Europe, having traveled around the world and having seen how shareholders are treated in different places, how the rule of law is observed or not in different places. There's a huge benefit and, and a huge peace of mind in the fact that when you own a US listed company, you have an amazing shareholder friendly culture. You have an incredible history of disclosure that's been built over time that the shareholders get to know what's going on within the business. Managements that grow up, you know, they are not all of them the best, but they serve the shareholder. They're not just serving themselves and very few people around the top executives. And the, the property rights that I talk about quite a bit, bit in my book, Money Life Family, property rights is kind of like the other big topic that people don't talk about. In the US, we are so comfortable with the fact that I bought the land, there's title insurance and so on, I know I own the land. Try to leave the US and go to a slightly more exotic place, and I don't mean Canada. <laughs> and you'll see <laughs> that property rights, it's, it's a blessing, it's a luxury, it's a privilege that's not available to everybody. And in many places, you might feel that you bought the land but you don't actually own it. And I have some personal family story where we bought the land and another owner showed up in Poland when things were changing and, and it was a whole mess with who owned the land after so many years of unclear uh, rules. And we ended up settling with the original real owner, not the one we bought the land from. So I have a very personal experience with the fact that just because you have a piece of paper that you, it says that you own it, 
it doesn't mean the same thing, <laughs> depending on where you are in the world. Poland is a very different place today, so don't get me wrong. But in the 1990s, 30 years ago, it was a country that was catching up with the world. So something to keep in mind when you think you own something, do you really own it? And the reason I mention it and the recent stories with Venezuela, Venezuela is one of the richest, if not the richest oil reserve countries in the world. Correct me if I'm wrong. One at some point was the, the richest or richest to be country in that's, South America. That's correct. And yeah, took a it's, path it's, it's one, one that rhymes with Cuba and Poland and other places on earth where they thought that the, the economy can work as a, not a free market economy, but a, a centrally planned socialist, communist, you name it, economy, and it failed. Uh, businesses were nationalized and it's only slowly resuming and it's a very slow process with a destroyed currency, destroyed banking, if you know people in Venezuela, which I happen to have met people that have lived there and left, it's it's a country that was the biggest country of the biggest promise, but the, the biggest destruction of, of wealth in the system. But the reason I mention it, closer to home, Colgate. Colgate is a familiar brand to a lot of people. If you look up filings from a few years back, you'll see how Colgate had a massive write-off for their assets in Venezuela because they had to walk away from those assets. I want to say it was a billion dollars, but I'll double check. But it was a very wow. large amount of money because they were producing for all of Latin America. And Colgate is just one of many countries that uh, many, many companies that had experienced that pain. So something to keep keep in mind when you have a company that has headquarters in the US, listed in the US, operations in 150 countries. It's good because it's diversified, but also remember what kind of risks they're taking on that you might not be fully aware of. And I think it's important to just note that things can change quickly. You just you have to be on top of it. I think I think more so than most people um, uh, most people think. And I, I, I've also I've read that book on uh, Bacardi that that you mentioned. I thought it was a really interesting mm -hmm. uh, book that good history of, of, of Cuba and very, very interesting story. And I, I thought that you did a good job uh, comparing that to um, the H Havana Club. <laughs> Things, things can happen. I think that's the big lesson to me, that things can happen and just be aware of it, be prepared for it. And some of the things are outright you know, theft when things are taken away from you. Some of it is a slow devaluation of your currency. Some of it can be a sudden devaluation of currency, like Argentina did on a couple of time, uh, occasions. Talk to Argentinians these days, and some of them are holding cash at home for a reason. <laughs> they, they, <don't, laughs> they have very limited trust in the system. Brendan, I want to ask you one last question. I, I love asking my guests about their definition of success, your professional and your personal definition of success. How do you know you're on the right track? Okay. Bogomila, I, I want to um, thank you for, for having me uh, again today. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. It's, it's, it's been a blast. Um, but I define success as being happy in a sustainable way. You might say, what on earth are you talking about? But um, <laughs> What, what I mean by that is in, in life, there are plenty of things that make you temporarily happy. Like you can go out and make an impulse purchase or eat some unhealthy food that'll make you may make you feel good for a period of time. But sustainable long term happiness um, comes from balancing the short term and the long term. And that's kind of how I approach everything. And I think that that's to some degree how investment type minds think of things um, it isn't happiness the purpose purpose of life like to to me success is achieving happiness through a sustainable balance in terms of long and short term trade-offs when weighing professional success um, personal relationships and personal health um, and, and this is a very different definition of success i think compared to most people a lot of people will say um they just strictly define success in terms of how much money has someone made or how much power have they seemingly amassed i i completely disagree with this because um, I've seen a lot of billionaires or very wealthy people who over the years, they, they run off a lot of the real authentic relationships that they, they've had. Um, and they, you know, sometimes, sometimes they'll work around the clock, neglect uh, everything else. And then th they'll se seemingly go out and purchase a mega yacht or, or something like, like that to make up for their shortfalls elsewhere. And um, I think what, what they, eventually find out is this, you know, 
did this make them happy? I, most of them, I would 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 say not. So I don't I don't deem that to be successful. I think you have to be happy in a sustainable way, and that um, ties back to um, you know professional success, personal relationships, personal health or personal health, and I think um, helping others to the degree that that's important to a person. So Morgan Housel had this article, and I think a podcast episode too, about, uh, I think he used the word optimal wealth, or a level of wealth that's uh, that maximizes your benefit. And it's a very different number for very different people, and might change over your lifetime as well. But when his point was that once you go past that point, it, it's actually detrimental for the reasons that you mentioned. You might be losing friends. Maybe not genuine people are gravitating towards you. People want to sell you things. People have to borrow money from you. It's all kinds of things that follow. So that's something to keep in mind. You pointed out something really interesting, and I have to mention Luca Delana, who was a guest on the show twice, and he wrote a book, Ergodicity. And I don't know if you're familiar with his name. I'll, I'll share more with you uh, after if you want yeah. but he has this idea of optimizing life in terms of living for a day like you have one day left or you have 50 years left and i think it's a great advice for living and investing how would you live if you had to balance the two just in case you have just one day left and just in case you you're going to be around for half a century <laughs> right so you'll never know but if you try to balance the two, you might come up with a relatively smart framework. You have some thoughts? I, I think that that's a, a, a very important statement. Um, and I, I, I think to some extent, and, and I sh should do more of this myself, but I think we need to think more about, you know, when we're on our deathbed, what do we want to look back on and say, I'm happy that I did? Um, and I don't think a lot of people are, are going to say, oh, what what brought me happiness was accumulating the most amount of money that I could could have had. It's highly unlikely that almost anyone as they're about to go is going to say that. I think it comes back to um, like uh, as you're alluding to um, some some things that are more sustainable you know having good personal relationships having some you know level of, of wealth that keeps you happy um and you know morgan housel also alludes the, uh, to this in in his writing but having a, a level of, of wealth also just makes you feel comfortable like you, you it, it's more of a if you think of it more in terms of a, a safety blanket as a, opposed to um you know being able to go out and pur purchase lavish things, uh, at least to me, I, I completely agree with that uh, line of thinking and I try and live by it. Uh, I don't know what your thoughts are. No, it's it's very true. I'm thinking, you know, we spoke about money quite a bit in this episode and, and with a lot of guests I speak about money and investing. We end up talking about time, independence and freedom. And you talked about it at the beginning, how in my mind, you know, money provide certain things the idea that you have six months of savings six months of expensive safe expensive saved expensive safety it gives you a peace of mind that you don't have to worry if you have you know 25 years some people claim that that's enough to claim uh, financial independence and so on so some money gives you the freedom to decide how you're going to spend your time and then it's your choice how you're going to go about it in terms of investing to me of course it's fascinating that if you're right some investments will do well and they will lead to compounding and growth in your wealth and, and make your clients happy, make your family happy if you're managing your family money. But to me, it's an intellectual pursuit. I mean, what I like the most about the last hour and a half was think about the all kinds of connections we made around history and, and biology and the pandemics and social interaction and how much we get to benefit from having really an excuse to, to read fascinating things and try to connect the dots and make sense of it. And then the stock market is kind of at the end of that road where, okay, I know these things and then I'll buy these kinds of stocks. But that's really at the end of the process. To me, getting there, learning about it, talking to people like you who spend you know years both traveling the world to get to know the world and reading so much about the history, just the intellectual benefit of 
testing your ideas, learning new things, questioning things. I think that gives me the majority of the satisfaction and, and money is kind of a bonus that it follows. And, and that's what I, I liked about your um, book, Crisis Investing, was the, the fact that you were writing these essays in, in real time. And I think that um, there's a good amount to be learned from that, because then you can go back later and, and learn, you know, how was I thinking at this time? It's it's one thing to, um, to go through some of these crises, but um, there, to, to try and go back to think about how you were thinking. But if you actually write it down in that moment it's usually different than um how you remember it later on so i, I think that that's uh, a an, an interesting perspective that uh, i appreciated about that i think that the one of the things best things that an investor can do or anybody can really do is to start writing even if you're not going to publish it even if, if you're not going to share it just start writing because even if it's a journal to yourself i think you can look back and as you mentioned you can learn from it and it creates a certain discipline in your thinking. The minute you write it down, it has a whole different dimension and power. And I can't imagine buying a single stock without being able to write down on a page or half a page, why is it that I think it's a good idea? There's something about it that changes the minute it's written down and you read it and you ask yourself, does this still make sense? And then you know, Peter Lynch had this idea of pitching an investment to, uh, to a kid both you have to do it quickly so you keep their attention and you have to do it in a simple way so they understand what you're talking about. And I think it's an amazing test for anybody building an investment case for any investment out there. Could you sit down with a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old or a 12-year-old and explain why that makes sense? And a lot of the technical stuff has to leave the room and you have to focus on the things that we all can relate to. Loyal customer base, special product, quality, attractive pricing, so on, so on. Things that we can all touch and relate to. But that's just my thought. Start writing if you can. I, I completely agree. And in writing, you learn, uh, at least to me, you learn the subject much more intimately than, than you would otherwise. If you're trying to describe something to someone else, you have to understand the subject matter deeply, at least if you're trying to write in a successful way. <laughs> and you have to write it in a way where somebody will understand it, not misunderstand <laughs> it, but you're not, when you're not in the room, like you have to remember, you're not gonna be in the room and somebody's reading it and you're not there to correct them and say, no, 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 that's not what I meant. That's the difference between a conversation and a written word, you're not in the room. Somebody's reading it and thinking something. So how do you write it so you're not misunderstood, first of all? and that people, the message, you get the message across. Brendan, this was incredible, and I highly recommend both of your books, Markets in Chaos and Wondering Investor. They're both wonderful reads, and I think you did a remarkable job of expanding all of our horizons and introducing us to history of some really unique moments in the past where things have not gone the way people expected, and we can learn from it. And to me, anytime anything bad happens, it's a good idea to sit down with a history book and realize it might have happened in the past. It's probably going to rhyme all over again. What is it that I can do to make the best decision today? I call it being the least wrong. I don't have to be 100% correct, but I want to be the least wrong. And uh, that's what I've learned. <laughs> and that's what I showed in the crisis investing book. Being the least wrong in times where things are uh, very uncertain. Brendan, thank you so much for today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Bogomo. I had, I had a blast um, the, the last hour and a half uh, talking about a, a wide range of, of topics. And I, I also I enjoyed your book, uh, Crisis in, in Investing. I thought it provides a unique perspective um, and talk about a, a number of really unique individuals, uh, that, you, like one in particular that I find it really interesting is Tony Deaton. Uh, you seem to have a personal relationship with him. Um, but uh, I think you talk about a, a number of interesting individuals and thought you did a good good job, uh, you know, documenting how you were thinking going through di different crises. So that, that was great. And I, uh, yeah, I, I had a really good time um, today d discussing. It was a wide ranging discussion, but um, we, 
We, we had a good time. Thank you so much. And, and Tony Deaton is a legendary investor based in Switzerland, and I highly recommend everybody just looking him up and finding that very long interview he gave at some point. I think one of very few interviews he ever gave where he explains how he thinks about family wealth management, investing for the long run, and what kind of businesses he invests in. And I think all of us that are serious about long-term patient investing could learn from him. And he's a very generous, wonderful person. And uh, he has some incredible lessons in that long interview that's out there available to everybody. Brendan, thank you again so much. Thanks Thanks a lot, Bogomo. You were listening to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question, what it means to live a rich life beyond money. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment and follow, subscribe, rate, and share with friends and family. We rely on word of mouth to promote the show. One click for you means the world to us. Thank you. Until next time, your host, Bogumil Baranowski. The content of this podcast is for general informational purposes only, and so are the opinions of members of Seacard Associates, a registered investment advisor, and guests of the show. This podcast does not constitute a recommendation to buy or sell any specific security or financial instruments or provide investment advice or service. Past performance is not indicative of future results. More information on Seacard Associates is available in its Form ADV disclosure documents available at advisorinfo.sec.gov.